have here today. Wow, just babies everywhere. So, with that being said, children are released to go with Andy. Well, praise the Lord. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. So let's get into this because I want to get you out of here by five tonight. So, we are working through the life of Paul. We have first seen that that his name was Saul, and today, today in the scriptures, we're going to see how his name was changed. We see Saul's persecution of the church. He was there when Stephen was martyred. We saw Paul's conversion, that he was knocked down, he was blinded. That's going to be important. It's on the test later. Remember that? I'm letting you know. Saul's time with Jesus. We know there was about a 14-year period of time that after Saul had that experience with Jesus, he disappeared. And most theologians believe he went to the top of Mount Sinai and he actually physically spent time with Jesus. And he says he did that in the beginning of Galatians, which will be the first book he wrote when he gets done with his first missionary journey. So we know he actually physically spent time with Jesus. We see changes in Saul's life. I mean, some pretty serious changes. And I'd like to say, man, he's the leader of those changes. But I know a lot of you. I know the fact that you're sitting here today means that God did some incredible changing in your life. Is that an amen? Amen. I mean, incredible. So, now... So then we saw how Paul preached. That was what we talked about last week. That's what God put on my heart. That the reason Antioch was just, it was the new Jerusalem. I mean, things were going on in Jerusalem, but then the Christian church seemed to move up to Antioch, and that became the hub of what was going on. And first, they preached to the Hellenistic Jews. Does anybody remember who they are? They are the Jews that adopted some of the Greek language, but lived in the Greek world outside of Jerusalem. So you kind of see this little step. Well, first the Jews, they're rejecting it. We go to the Hellenistic Jews, they started to accept it. And then you can see Jesus is preparing Peter's heart, which someday we'll get into his story. But he kind of coincides with Paul right now as they're both figuring out the whole, hey, we're going to minister to the Gentiles, to the Greeks, to the Romans, to people that you never would have thought, which we're going to see today. So Saul preached, Jesus is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus. Do we get an amen there? I just want to make sure you agree with that. So here we see... Saul and Barnabas goes and gets Saul and he says, wow, things are going on in Antioch. Do you need to get over there? So they travel to Antioch. And this is words of Paul right here in this letter to Timothy. He says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, that man Jesus Christ. There's no doubt how he preached when he took the gospel to the world. In Antioch, They were first called Christians. They were first called Christians in Antioch. I'm going to read through. We're in chapter 13. And this is the this is when they get called. So in Acts 13, 1 to 4. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Hellenistic Jew, Simeon. Hellenistic Jew, and Niger, Hellenistic Jew, Lucius of Cyrene, Hellenistic Jew, and Manahan. He was the only person who was 100% Jewish, who was from Jerusalem, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Holy Spirit said, they were led by the Spirit, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. 
So who sent Paul and Barnabas away? The Holy Spirit. What did they do before they left? They fasted and prayed. What does fasting mean? It means you're not eating for a little bit, right? You're taking this physical need where your stomach is going, I want food, and you're saying, nope. God's more important because God said that he is the bread of life. And I am going to live on him. So it's a way of focusing on the things that God wants for you in your life. The things that the Holy Spirit is leading on. Instead of giving into self, you focus on God. That's the whole point of fasting. Someday we'll do a sermon on that. And pray. Lay hands on them and send them away. So here we go, folks. Here we go. They are in Antioch, which is right here. And boom, first missionary journey, the blue line. They get on and they travel to Cyprus. Okay, so now we're going to start with this story today. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. <laughs> Future preacher. Future preacher, folks. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And also had John, which is John Mark, he went with them to be their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Bar means son of. So he's trying to claim himself as the son of Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimas, that's the other name for the sorcerer, which means the enlightened one, probably a name he gave himself. Elimas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, folks, first time. There he is. Paul means basically little. A lot of people believe that his name got changed because he converted the proconsul. Paul is more... Now, in the past, we see Jesus changing names. That's not what happened with Saul. Saul changed it himself. Paul is a version of Saul, but it is what the Greeks would call him. Okay? So it was, it was identifying him in the Roman Greek world because I believe Paul was starting to think this is my ministry. This is what I've been called to do. So I'm now going to change my name to a version. So my name is Robert, but people call me Bob. Um, down in, the, in uh, Mexico, you have Jesus, but up here we would say Jesus. You have Matthew, Matthias. So if a person's going around saying my name is Matthias, we might be like, oh, I, I've never heard that name. I don't know what it means. And, and you, they went, oh, Matthew. That's what Paul was doing. He was changing his name so that there would be acceptance to the people that he was going to minister to. So there you go. That's the whole thing about Paul. So Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. This is the sorcerer. And said... Oh, full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you. You shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time, and immediately a darkness fell on him. And he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Wow, folks. So, some people come to me and they say, man, I don't know what my ministry is. God hasn't made it clear to me yet. And I said, he speaks through the word of God. The word of God says, and he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Is it any clearer there? 
Could God have people say, I wish he'd have been a little clearer in this verse or that verse. Could he have been any clearer when he says what he's saying right here? Jesus is the only way. Okay, so when people tell me I'm confused about my ministry and what I'm supposed to be doing, and I say, well, right there, it says go into all the world and preach the gospel. Yeah, but I'm working a full-time job. I got a family. I can't be a missionary. That's not what that means. Does your neighbor not live in the whole world? Does not the people across town live in the whole world? Yes. So we're to go minister. Even if it's the world as we know it, God has you in a place. He may have called a missionary to go wherever, but he's called you to do what you're doing right here. And if that means you're the person that paints the walls, then God has got you there working in the ministry. If you're the person that takes care of the children, whatever God has called you to do, you're ministering to the world. So get to be part of that. All right, so the first thing we see here is he was led by the Holy Spirit. He was sent out by the Holy Spirit. After being handpicked, it says, and when they arrived, it says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. Verse 4. So there's no doubt who sent them. When you know you're walking in the power of God, in the place that he has you, you're going to be filled with that power. You are going to be able to do things in the name of Jesus Christ because you know you're there. But it's listening and hearing the Holy Spirit. And we need to do that more in our lives. So, we see the number one thing is they're led by the Holy Spirit. And where do they go? Here they go, right off to Cyprus. The Holy Spirit leading them. So it's about 100 miles from Antioch, southwest. What's one of the reasons that maybe they start there? We learn who is with them. John Mark, Paul, and who else? Barnabas. Where is Barnabas from? Cyprus. So what do you think? When he's excited and he's like, I got this, I got this evangelist here, Barnabas. He's like, he's like I'm, I got this evangelist, Paul. He's preaching up a storm. He's preaching about Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. And he's changing people's lives. There's just revival breaking out. You know what? I'm going to take them to my house right now. What's the first thing that everybody comes to the altar? I got a father, a mother, a sister, a brother who's not walking with the Lord, and it breaks our heart. And what does he do? Boom! Hey, Saul, first place you're going. Out of all your missionary trips, you're going to where I live. And you're preaching to my family. Because that was in the heart of Barnabas. Do we have that heart, folks, when it comes to our family and those around us? It was his home. He said, you're going there. I fear sometimes that people might be like, oh, I got saved. But I can't go back home because they're going to think I'm nuts. They're going to be like, oh, look at this, this holy roller now. This mush head, as they used to affectionately call us at work. Oh, great. Another mush head. We would hear that all the time. But you know what? It's the first thing that Barnabas says, I need you to go to my home. So the missionary thing starts here. So now they preach all through all through Cyprus. They preach all through where Barnabas lived. They go to Salamis. That's a leading city. It was the seat of the government there. And there are two things we should keep in mind about Paul and his missionary journey. First, he always went where the people were. And again, this was the seat of the government there. And second, Paul always went to the Jewish people first. He would find the most influential synagogue, and he'd go there and preach about Jesus. Now, you say, well, wasn't his ministry to the Gentiles? Well, yes. But remember, as clear back as Abraham, God said, I'm setting your people apart. 
I'm set, you're going to be my people and they're going to be set apart. And the Jews were meant to proclaim Jesus Christ. But that didn't happen. And we hear the story where Jesus says, well, if I have a wedding and I invite all my relatives, but they don't come, then go out into the cities and streets and invite anybody else who will come. So it wasn't like Jesus was saying they're set way above everybody else. No, he said they're set apart. They are to be my mouthpiece. But if you go in there and you preach the gospel to them and they reject you, what do you do? Wipe the dust off your feet and move on. So every time you see Paul, the first place he goes, he goes into the synagogues. He did this because he was a well-known teacher in the synagogues before this. So he would have been accepted. So he walks into the synagogue and they go, oh, Saul's here. And then he would walk up and go, hi, I go by Paul now. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Paul, Paul is here. Remember, he was a great teacher. He chased those Christian people around and persecuted them. Let's let him stand up and talk. And he would get up in front of everybody and go, Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. And let me tell you about the mysteries. Clear back to the prophets. Prophesying that Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross for your sins. He was, and you can tell. It does say every now and then that some of them believed. But for the most part, they were like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait. Hey, be quiet, be quiet. You're preaching heresy. We thought you were this, this Pharisee and you come in here preaching all this craziness. Out. And a lot of times he didn't last long, but it was always the first place he went. Amen. Oh, man, praise the Lord. He preached the word of God. He preached salvation through faith. And why? Again, being led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. You see that constantly through here. And again, we have churches out there now who say the Holy Spirit is non-existent in this time. And that is not true, folks. We are to be led by the Holy Spirit constantly. Because Jesus said, when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you, John 14, 26. So you put the word in the heart, just like these children. Put the word in their heart. And when they need it, God's going to bring it up. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. All right. He preached the word of God. Salvation through Christ. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will teach us everything we need to know. But you know what? The Holy Spirit doesn't say it for us. We need to go into the world and preach the gospel. That's the command God gave us. So now, we see Paul, he goes... And he's going to preach the gospel, but he comes across some opposition. Have you ever had opposition in your life? All right. Now, when he had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Gilemus, who was our Jesus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So, they show up at this place. And this proconsul calls them and says, I want to hear what you're preaching. This sorcerer, or false prophet, had attached himself to the proconsul. Who is the proconsul? Picture him much like the mayor. He was the person that was in between the Romans in that little area and the citizens of that area and the senators of the Roman council. The people, he was in charge of law and order, but he was also 
So, you know, like in Washington, D.C., they have people that just sit and watch CNN and Fox News because sometimes before D.C., the White House even gets news, it's on those stations. And they run in and say, hey, there's news on the station. You need to watch this. So we still do that to this day. Picture him kind of like that. Two people come in with a whole new message, and he hears this message is sweeping the world that they know of. Bring it to me. I want to hear this message. Why? Now, but it says that he, it says he was an intelligent man. The Bible actually goes out of their way to say he was an intelligent man. I hate to tell you, but if I somehow ever had ended up in a book that God wrote about me, that would be the last thing anybody ever said. You must be a pretty smart guy if somehow God calls you an intelligent man. But he allowed this false prophet to attach himself to him. Why? Why do you think he did that? He let a false prophet attach himself because it says in Deuteronomy 18, 10, and 12. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. Folks, that's a big thing in our community right now. Well, we, we call it, and this is going down the political correct path right now. However, I'm stepping against it. We need to realize that in our community, we abort so many babies every year. Yes. And that is not God's plan. And that's what this is addressing. Children, and somebody might say, well, they're not a child yet. However, God clears that up and says, I knew you in the womb. Mm -hmm. And in Psalms, he describes how he forms and makes a baby in the womb. So, as far as our Christian beliefs go, this is no different. Never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. Do not let your people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. Now he's talking about Joshua going into the promised land. You guys know who Joshua is? Yes. Yeah, okay. If you've been here for a while, you probably know him well. Okay. So, all this goes to show is that this man, and as I was praying about this, this proconsul was searching. He was searching for the things of God. And when somebody is searching, they'll say, well, hey, maybe I should go to one of these fortune tellers or one of these sorcerers. And then the world comes out and says, well, it's okay. We can have dark witches and white witches. And they've gone down a path that God does not want us going down, folks. And even sometimes in movies, it's kind of sugar-coated. And I tell parents, be aware of what your children are watching and just make sure you're discussing these things with them. Okay? So... God tells us, stay away from this. So why would an intelligent man pull this sorcerer in? Because he was searching. He's like, I want to know about God. He's a Roman, folks. Actually a very important Roman. Basically like we would have Paul our governor. He was in between the people and the Senate. Okay? So an important man. So now he finally says, I want to hear about God. So Paul and Barnabas are like, no problem. We will tell you about God. Because that's what we like to do. Share the word of God. So an intelligent man, this man <coughs> called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them. In other words, stood against them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. This this sorcerer had the governor wrapped around his finger. And he knew, he knew that if the proconsul listened 
to Paul and Barnabas, he would lose his special place in life. His life would be changed. But not only that, Paul recognized something else. And here is, here is something very important. We see how Jesus changes lives. We say it costs you nothing to come to Jesus Christ, and that is true. But it will cost you everything. I'd love to explain that more, but we'll have you here way too late. He told the governor not to listen to Paul and Barnabas. Let me ask you this. How do you respond to opposition? It's guaranteed, folks. Guaranteed. In John, it says, Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. You are going to have opposition to the word of God. It's promised, folks. And this is what Paul and Barnabas had. So, Paul could have just snapped his fingers. And the sorcerer could have just died. Could have. But Jesus said, hate the sin, love the sinner. Hate the sin, love the sinner. And we see this because when the two apostles were with Jesus and somebody offended them and they said, hey, should we rain down fire from heaven? In Luke, let's look at that story. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire and come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. So here we see a classic example of Paul hating the sin, but loving the sinner. He didn't condemn him to death. But we see the Holy Spirit working here. So, then Paul, or Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit... Again, we keep seeing that, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, the sorcerer, and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you will not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord. So, we see here that Paul recognizes what's going on as a spiritual fight. The Bible says we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities of the air. Now there were times Jesus walked up to people and said, you're sick, and he healed them. Then he walked up to people and said, this is spiritual. And that, folks, is what Paul is seeing here. This is demonic, and he's calling it out. Bar Jesus was the son of Jesus. That's what the man called himself. Or Elimus, the enlightened one. And what is Paul doing here? He's referring right to, you're not the son of Jesus, you're the son of Satan. He reverses his name. Oh, full of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness. You know, Satan means accuser. And the devil is the translation of Satan throughout the days. So it's the accuser. He's going to accuse. But he can't accuse someone that's made as white as snow, right? He tries, but he can't. So, <laughs> so Paul sees this and he calls it right out. And he says, you know what? Not going to happen. You son of Satan. Most theologians will agree that this right here is some of the most powerful words that Paul ever used when confronting the enemy. They are very powerful words. You son of Satan, you're filled with deceit and fraud. You enemy of righteousness. Satan is the accuser. 
He tries to go after our righteousness and accuses us when we've been made righteous. So Paul sees it. Boy, does he get right into the nitty gritty there with these words. You son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? So anybody ever have those people show up on your doorstep? Trying to preach the gospel to you. And when you say, praise the Lord, I'm saved. They go, oh, oh, no, no, no. There's only, no, we want to tell you about. To me, it's a cult. I'm sorry, folks. I'm going to call it right out as it is. And I can, I can find common ground when I sit with Catholics, Methodists, Anglicans. But if someone comes to your door from, uh, well, there's a few, few different, few different uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I want to just tell you this, folks. Again, I can find unity with anybody that I sit with. However, they do not believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. They don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. When they come to my door, I will tell them straight up. There's a verse in the Bible talking about what you're doing right now. And I take them to 2 Corinthians 11, 14, 15. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. If you deny the deity of Jesus Christ, you're taking the gospel story and you're twisting it and you're perverting it. Sure, I'll get in a theological discussion about infant baptism. Okay, I'll get in a theological discussion even about the works of the Holy Spirit. But folks, if somebody tries to tell me that Jesus is not Lord, you have just taken the Holy Word and made it completely worthless. Because our whole, we learned about the tabernacle and how Jesus represents everything. He became our sacrifice. He came down from heaven, died on the cross. It's what makes you righteous. If he's not God, we have a problem there. And I say, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> so when they come to my door, but I love them, I call them out just like, just like Paul did here. You are bringing a false truth. Do you want to know the truth? Sit down and listen to me. And most of the time, there will be a senior person who will grab them and say, no, nope, we need to leave right now because they don't want them here in the Word. I went to a mall once, and there was a Jehovah's Witness preaching to people in the mall, and I walked up, and I said, I have one question to ask you. Is Jesus Christ God? And it was almost like something evil. No! Came right out of them. So folks, call it what it is. Don't fall for false prophets because that's what's going on in the world right now. Again, I can sit down with a Catholic priest and have a meal and talk theology. But if you're going to tell me that Jesus Christ is not God, we have a problem. And I will call it out just like Paul did right here. He did not mince words. He called it out. Okay. So then he calls it out, and now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time, and immediately a darkness fell on him, and he ran around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. So, and now indeed the hand of the Lord. So Saul recognizes this is a spiritual battle, not a physical one. He calls it out, he addresses it. That's what God wants you to do. You know, sometimes we have arguments in our marriage. I remember Bob and Kim coming to me and going, wow, we had a bad argument last night. And halfway through it, we realized this is spiritual. And we both just stopped and went, yep, it's 100% spiritual. We're not even arguing about something sensible. We, there, Satan has got through the door to us. And immediately, God is telling you, you have power when it comes to that. 
That's when you say, I rebuke you, Satan. Satan cannot stand against the word of God. If we resist Satan, what does it say he has to do? Flee! Can I say that again? If we resist Satan, what does it say he has to do? Flee! Flee. So right here we see Paul, and he says, I recognize you, you son of the devil. You're bringing a word against righteousness. You're trying to pervert the word of God because you're a false prophet. And you've come like an angel of light. We think Satan's going to show up with a pitchfork and some hooves. And he doesn't. The Bible says he will be an angel of light. An angel is a beautiful thing. And an angel is known as a messenger of God. So he's going to come to you and say, I'm a beautiful angel with a message from God. Jesus is not God. Know your word, people. Because God promises, Jesus says it's going to happen. He's going to come to you like an angel of light. A false prophet. So, Paul rebukes him, recognizes it. This is a big thing, folks. He recognizes it's a spiritual battle. In your prayer life, when you... So I know sometimes I'll struggle with somebody who's like, well, I, I don't believe in Jesus. I've searched it a little bit, and I'm struggling with, you know, like, all the Bible, the earth being made in seven or six days, and... And I'll struggle with that. But when somebody comes against me or I know that it's a spiritual thing and not just a worldly old man thing popping up in someone's heart, that's when you have the power of God to speak against it. And as we've seen over and over and over in these verses, who is it that brings that forth in Paul's heart? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit. That's all you keep seeing. Paul is aware. He says, whoa, this is spiritual. And he lets him have it. But he doesn't condemn him to death. He hates the sin. He loves the sinner. So what does he do? He blinds the man. Wait a minute. Wasn't someone else blinded a little while ago? Who was that? Saul. And Saul, because he was blinded, look at the transformation in his life. So this is an act of love, folks. It's an act of love. We sometimes look, oh, oh man, God's a rough God. Look at all the stuff he did. He is going to do whatever it takes to get your heart to him, to get a relationship to him, to get you to call on him. And if that means your car gets flipped upside down in a snowstorm and flying through the woods and you're like, oh, Lord, it's going to happen. He's going to do whatever he can to get you turning to him, calling on his name or doing what he needs to do to have that relationship with you. And that's what Paul did right here. He says, you know what? My life was changed when I was blinded. I came to know the love, the peace, and the joy of God. So there you go. You're going to be blind for a while, but not forever. He says, for a period of time, because we all can repent, we can all come to the Lord, and then our life changes. So he leaves that door open. This is just a small part of scripture, and I'm sorry, I, I, I love teaching my way through it, and we're running out of time. But, in the end, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the what? Teaching of the Lord. So really, what was it that converted the proconsul's heart? It wasn't the fact that you just saw this guy get blinded. I mean, yeah, that you saw it. And that probably really got him listening. But he believed because of the teaching of the Lord. The word of God. Don't ever underestimate what it can do in a person's life. I was just sharing this morning with my buddy there, Mr. Fortin, and he. I said, you know what? Sometimes I go through my sermon and I think I didn't put enough jokes in there. I didn't do this. I won't hold their attention. Lord, I, I, I need some help with this. 
And then God just told me, if you just stood up and read the word and added nothing else, it's going to change your life. And it's going to change their lives. Because my promise is that the Holy Spirit is going to take that word and he's going to churn it up in your life. Folks, we need to stop chasing sorcerers. We need to stop chasing crystal balls and tarot cards and everything else. You can't walk into a gas station and not see them. And start looking for the direction of the Holy Spirit. And if you want that in your life, you need it this morning, well, we're going to come up and sing a song and we're going to pray about that. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The word translated advocate comes from the Greek word. I was going to get into all this stuff. Basically, what he's saying is someone called to your side. That's what that word means. So today we see Paul. He was led by the Spirit. He faced opposition. But he overcame by the Spirit's power. Constantly, it says, because of the Holy Spirit, because of the Holy Spirit, he recognized the spiritual warfare because of the Holy Spirit. And then because of the Holy Spirit, he spoke boldly. He recognized the spiritual influence. He called it out. And then he had power over it through the blood of Jesus Christ. And truly, it was because of love. So if somebody comes to my door with a perverted message, I'm going to love them. But I'm going to tell them. I'm going to give you the only way. And I'm not going to listen to the perversion coming out of your mouth. If you want to stand here and listen, I'll tell you about how to get to eternity. You don't have to work it off. You don't have to do anything. It's a free gift of grace. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. 100% man, 100% God.